This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. A jam-packed show for you today on this Tuesday. Of course, our first look at NFL Week Number 3 coming up later on, a recap of Week 2. We've got Brandon Gadula on to talk about the President's Cup and golf and betting on that. But, of course, it's Tuesday, which means K-Props with Pitching Ninja. Rob Friedman will get his thoughts on all those later on today. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here by Rob Friedman. Check him out on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. You can find all of his fantastic work at Fox, MLB, Nesson, and Peacock. Rob, only about two weeks left in the regular season. It is getting down to the nitty gritty here. How are you doing today? I am doing great. How are you? I'm delightful. I'm excited for some baseball. My twins are toast. uh, So I can just kind of sit back and enjoy baseball. And honestly, like it's fun when your team's in it, but I like having the freedom to just ignore the twins and sit back and watch some fun pitchers. And I think we get that for tonight too. So I'm ecstatic. I'm ecstatic uh, about what we're going to see the next couple of weeks. You make a really good point there. I think (laughs) detaching yourself from your team and enjoying the game is that's kind of the way I approach everything. So I, I don't root for anybody. I root for pitchers Correct. and th- it makes it really enjoyable for me. I, I don't get, you know, I get mad at individual situations sure, you know, if I have a sure, pick sure. or something, but uh, you know, not having a team, having a team or being too closely associated it blinds you to everything else. So I, yeah. I kind of like that too. Yeah. And I would prefer they were in it, but honestly, whatever, I'm not going to complain too much about all of that. Now, the problem that we usually have, uh, we have for today, Rob, is usually what we do is I'll ask you for your strikeout props. You'll give me your recommendations. And then I'll ask you about one that I've got. We did get Jordan Montgomery last week at six plus, but I've got nothing today. I looked at every strikeout prop on the board of FanDuel Sportsbook and I saw nothing. So I have to lean on you for this one because otherwise I'm just sitting back and hanging out. So when you look at the board for today, where are you seeing value in the strikeout props for tonight? First, I want to say I'm disappointed because every time I'm on, I hear a K prop that I really didn't appreciate as much as you did. (laughs) And then I look into it. I'm like, you know, he's on to something. So the fact that you didn't see anything and I have three. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a little bit, but no, I'm very comfortable with my three. Yeah. The key thing, the good thing is that I didn't look at the games before 705 because I try to like double dip my work. I'm looking at the the DFS main slate. So I don't look at the early games. It sounds like you've got some action on those. So I think despite the fact I found nothing, that doesn't mean that I'm I'm against these ones because they sound pretty fun. Good. Well, I have a I have a three leg parlay with a same game parlay of Brian Bayo for five K's or more, Nick Lodolo for seven K's or more, and then in the nightcap, we'll go Luis Castillo for 8Ks or more. I think that that Bayo versus Lodolo matchup, just from like a, you know, we're talking about having, you know, being able to roof whatever, that from a matchup perspective, two really fun guys is super intriguing. Now, Bayo, I want to talk about him first. We'll talk about Lodolo, who's super exciting in a second. But Bayo is a guy who combines like enough strikeouts, but also kills some worms. And that's a really tough combination, it seems like, especially for a young guy what allows him to kind of tap into both those skills simultaneously? I think it's a combination of his, I mean, that sinker changeup combo. His his slider's been getting, I mean, getting some pretty good movement. But I think the sinker slider, obviously, sinker uh, changeup, you're going to pound the ball into the ground. But he gets enough movement on it sometimes to miss bats. And the changeup especially, since it mirrors his sinker, um, he's able to at least fool folks with velocity. So. He's got a really good changeup, obviously. I mean, people have made comparisons with Pedro, and he st- things are clicking with him. His last few outings, like he's been clicking. He's leaning on the the veteran pitchers to learn stuff. I like him. He's gotten, you know, he's 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 starting to get a little bit more on the K side. Um, I like what he's about. I think he's going to be an exciting pitcher for years. Yeah, and that's a good staff to learn from, too. There are a lot of smart guys there who you can lean on for sure. Now, let's talk about Lodolo. It's been a rough year for the Reds, obviously, but he's been the exception. Um, In his 16 starts, which is a big sample, by the way. That is a big sample. 30% strikeout rate. Tough matchup, though, with the Red Sox. Not a big strikeout team. What gives you confidence in him being able to navigate his way around that really tough lineup? I think it's just his pure stuff that that curveball slider, whatever he calls it. I think it's just a let's go breaking ball. Yeah, um, is is one of low key the 
filthiest pitches in the major leagues. It ends up behind a hitter, I think, more than any other pitch in baseball <laughs> for a strikeout. So he's like, I don't think he's the ordinary guy to go up against. I know the Red Sox uh, lineup is tough, but seeing him is is something different. And that pitch looks like a strike for a long way and ends up, you know, often behind hitters. Yeah, and he's been a delight. So no objections on either of those for me. Again, they're not on the games that I analyze. So you got uh, Bayo over four and a half at minus 118. Lodolo on a single leg, minus 156. You pair that with the Castillo over seven and a half. That gets you to plus 492 for the three-leg parlay there. And Castillo's facing off with Oakland. You were talking about that before we came on the air, about his most recent start against Oakland. And obviously the results were not there. But what do you see that gives you confidence in the bounce back here for Castillo the second time around? I liked his last few outings. I think he was electric. And I also, the, the fact that Gilbert just dominated, yeah. um, dominated yesterday, I think he will feed off some of that. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I like Castillo generally. Yeah. I mean, I do too. I mean, he's been fun and I think it's been encouraging to see that translate to the Mariners. We talked about this with Jordan Montgomery a bit where you change teams get a different set of eyes in there. They, I mean, outside of recent, they still let Castillo be Castillo. He's going deep in games, a bit of a different pitch mix. Um, he's had a couple more, um, a couple more uh, two seamers in there his past eight starts with the Mariners. But honestly for him, I don't think that's a bad thing. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think that staff is actually a very competitive staff. I mean, if you look at it, Mariners have a crap load of pitching. So yeah. I think having guys like, you know, you see, one, they won't try to outdo each other. A good pitching staff does that. And I think having Castillo follow up somebody, you know, that that angry outing yeah. by Gilbert just challenges him because Castillo pitches on emotion too. Yeah. And uh, I, I kind of, you know, I, I think he wants to one up Gilbert. I think he wants to one up Gilbert, but I also think he just wants to be on the mound. And that's encouraging for me at this point in the year where they're basically locked into playoffs. Uh, they kind of know where they're going to be. They're still letting him go about 100 pitches per start. And it's not 115, 190, you know, what he's typically going. Uh, but like, it's still very long. So you pair those three together plus 492 uh, for that one. Yeah. And, you know, obviously this is a tough time of year because you don't know. Yeah. I've been burned recently by guys getting pulled early. Um, you know, who knows? Maybe Castillo will have an outing like he did the other day where he's just king everybody at the beginning of the game. And you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, yeah. it's the fourth inning he's done. <laughs> yeah, he already got those eight strikeouts. So I think that those are pretty fun. I feel better about this slate now, having talked to you. I think that uh, <laughs> there there are enough strikeouts out there for me to feel pretty good about it. Uh, but again, check out Brian Bayo, Nick Lodolo, and Luis Castillo. And make sure you check out Rob Friedman as well over on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. Rob, I hope the strikeouts are in abundance for you for tonight's specific. Specifically with that Red Sox uh, versus Reds game. I think that's going to be a fun one to watch. Castillo, always a delight as well. Enjoy. Uh, Charlie Morton is tonight too. I know he's one of your favorites as I well. Almost so picked him. Yep. Have a blast watching some baseball for tonight, Rob. Thanks. Great as always, Jim. All righty. Again, check out Rob Freeman on Twitter at Pitching Ninja and check out his work at MLB, Nesson, Fox, and Peacock as well. And check him out here every Tuesday as well for the next couple of weeks as well. We're going to get to Brandon Gadula to talk about some President's Cup from a golf betting perspective in just one second. But first, big news FanDuel has an all new mobile gaming app, FanDuel Face Off. FanDuel Face Off is where you compete in quick, fun games against other real people for real cash. It is all sorts of games you're familiar with, like a home run derby, Wheel of Fortune, the Pat Mac could be kicking game and so much more contests are action-packed and last between two to five minutes you can play on your couch waiting in line during a commercial break wherever and on your schedule plus you can practice for free anytime whether it be head-to-head -head, multiplayer or larger tournaments fatal face-off has something for you plus in most contests you've matched up against players of similar skill levels so you're never totally overmatched, even as a beginner. FanDuel Faceoff is tied to your FanDuel account and wallet, so you can easily use your daily fantasy funds or sportsbook winnings in the app. Visit FanDuel.com slash Faceoff or download the FanDuel Faceoff face app in the Apple App Store today to get in the game. Age and location restrictions apply. Void for prohibited. See FanDuel.com slash Faceoff for terms and conditions. We got some golf back on the menu, so let's bring Brandon Gadula back into our lives to talk about that. It is the President's Cup for this week in Brandon, and because there's no DFS for this typically, I don't know a lot about the President's Cup. My like golf focus is hyper-focused on the DFS side of things, so I need you to educate me about this week. But first, though, uh, we haven't had you on covering the spread in a bit because golf's had a weird schedule. How you doing? 
Good, good. Yeah, I was a bit busy last week uh, when I talked about the Fortnet. Did the sol- the Heat Check podcast solo, which is always uh, a bit of a grind because I learned how much of the hosting duties you do, which is all of them. Uh, but uh, it's all anyone who did this point, baby. Anyone who did listen, uh, hopefully, took some action on Max Homa. Yeah, uh, Max Homa, a thrilling win. Got off to that big lead early on, and then uh, used some witchcraft to win the thing on Sunday as well. Homa just seems like one of the best dudes on the tour. So I always delight when he does well. Now I got to ask you about the president's cup because I know in theory what it is. I know it's like team play. I know it's the U S versus the world, but like what is the actual format for the president's cup? And what does that format do from a betting perspective? Yeah. So it's basically the Ryder cup. Uh, the diff- the, the key difference is that just who's in it. It's the United yeah. States is in both of them uh, as we probably all know, but the distinction here for the president's cup is that it is the U S versus the world minus Europe. It is a much newer event started in 1994. Uh, the host course alternates between the U S and elsewhere in the world um, started in the U S for the first two years, but then it has alternated since then. This year, it's in Quail Hollow in Charlotte. Uh, it's a course that uh, I know we're all probably somewhat familiar with, at least in terms of, of hearing the name. It's a long par 71. And, you know, one of the aspects of, you know, a Ryder Cup, President's Cup is course selection and trying to figure out how best to pick the right course for your team. Unsurprisingly, the U.S. picked a long course. Uh, they have a lot of long hitters. Um, and I'll break down sort of the, just the general team strength a, a little bit later, but yeah, it's uh it's going to be a course that benefits the U S now, as far as the format itself uh, teams do play in team events, uh, mm-hmm. alternate shot or foursomes, and then also best ball formats or four ball. So we'll get uh, two days each of those. And then on Sunday we get 12 singles matches The way that you accrue points is if you win your match, you get a point. If you tie your match or have it, you get half a point. And first to 15 and a half will win. Um, And yeah, that's basically it. It's pretty simple. So you're just basically looking at team strength. Is that, is that a fair way to look at it at it? Or do you need to like view it some way different? So I looked at team play for the Ryder cup in detail last year and tried Mm -hmm. to look at, team similarity and uh, you know long-term strokes gain numbers and granular strokes gain numbers and like the better tee to green golfers have advantages and uh, it all sort of boils down to the better golfers or the better golfers and if you can uh, you want better tee to green golfers um, and that's you know basically the U.S. in, in this event so it kind of is what it is I think that uh, there's a there's a mentality that match play comes down to putting and it's important, but if you're playing with other golfers and you both play similar styles, that's going to help in theory. But also if you play, uh, if you're getting two greens in regulation, gaining strokes, tee to green, you're more likely to win. So that's basically what it comes down to. So you said this favors the U S and the betting odds reflect that USA minus 700 at FanDuel Sportsbook uh, international is plus 750 draw is uh, 20 to one. That's actually an important number to have in mind, honestly, uh, that does impact the way you want to bet things in general. So you want to keep that in mind with the draw. Is there any value for you in that market? Is it properly reflecting how good the U.S. is or are you staying away from it? I think it's really close. Um, These these things are really hard to predict. Now, we're not looking at like a, a spread here, like a point spread in terms of we're just looking at outright. And it's important that I lay out how dominant the U.S. has been. Since 1994, we've had 13 President's Cups, the U.S. 11-1-1. One, and one. The lone international win came in 1998 uh, at Royal Melbourne. The tie came in 2003, ended in darkness. That was in South Africa. So in the U.S., the U.S. is 7-0. and oh. um, Again, they hosted the first two. Uh, only one home win for the U.S. was closer than three points. Again, it's a kind of a tight spread of points, like a dispersion, but that's a pretty solid margin. So if you base it off of history, the U.S. is the obvious play and just about any other way you slice it, too. If you look at the true strokes gained averages for golfers available at Data Golf over the past year, the U.S. averages uh, a plus 1.54, which is the third weakest team in U.S. history. 
Um, however, it's within a tenth of a shot of being like an average U.S. team, so it's not that big of a deal. For the internationals, they're a, a plus 0.91, which is more than half a shot worse on average than the U.S. team. Uh, it's the second worst international team ever, but again, within a tenth of a shot of being sort of average, we only have you know this for, the 14th iteration of it, so it's it's kind of tight. But um, you know, it, it's it's pretty lopsided from from that regard. Uh, additionally, we'll say the global golf landscape has hurt the, the international team pretty heavily. Why would that uh, be, Brandon? Expand. <laughs> we're going to have uh, eight of the 12 internationals making their debut. So their veterans are Adam Scott, Hideki Matsuyama, and then Sungjae Im and Siwoo Kim have each played one. So an experience gap for uh, the, the international side to overcome. The U.S. still does have six rookies, but those in- <laughs> for the President's Cup, those include Scotty Scheffler, uh, world number one, Colin Morikawa, uh, multiple major winner. Max Homa, who's just like unstoppable right now. Billy Horschel, who's won, you know, the WGC match play. Cameron Young, who has two top threes at majors. And Sam Burns has four PGA Tour wins. So, Decent. again, it's 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 tough. Now, yeah. I did my best to model this out, looking at strokes gained averages uh, and how that correlates to points scored and then the, the range of outcomes and – I have, so we need, we need the international team to be about 12% likely to win. I have them around 20% likely to win. So the model again, which went back and accurately would have predicted pretty well. um, Yeah. Yeah. The results here within the point margins, but I don't think I'm quite, you know, maybe like a quarter unit uh, for some fun, but I, I, if you're really trying to like, put down something large I, I can't i cannot recommend betting the international side because they're at such a detriment just based on overall strength but also the course fit yeah i saw data golf tweeting out their numbers yesterday and i think that they were pretty similar to yours in terms of like I, they might have had international actually a bit higher i think it was like 24 percent, but i also could be misremembering from a single tweet that i read so so um, i had it at, yeah. i had it at 24 percent, and then i tried to factor in the host advantage okay um, there's yeah. a pretty big host advantage so yeah. somewhere around there yeah okay that makes sense. Uh, so probably not betting into the the USA versus international market unless you want some fun on the international side. But we do have other markets available depending on the states. I know New York is more limited. So if you're listening to New York, sorry. Uh, but other states do have other props up for this event. Any value for you in those? Yeah, so it's basically like point scores. So if you lead the US in points, international in points, if you're the, like a, a captain's choice or a wild card, you know, you can be... Uh, there, there's markets for that. But if you look at uh, the overall points leaders, we have 18 because uh, we've had some ties over these. Um, 16 of those 18 played in five matches. So you kind of want volume. They averaged uh, a good stroke scan number of 1.68. Uh, just one golfer uh, was below 0.75. The guys who are below 0.75 this year, Sebastian Munoz, KH Lee, Siwoo Kim, Cameron Davis, Kevin Kisner, uh, Ju Young Kim and uh, Christian Bezaden Hote. So yeah, that's six of seven of those guys on the international team. Um, Eleven of the eighteen top uh, ranked top ten in strokes gained average for uh, you know among the the Presidents Cup teams. The top five this year, I won't list all of them: Scotty Scheffler, Patrick Cantlay, Justin Thomas, Xander Schauffele, and Sung J M. A name that I'll come back to in, in just a bit. Eleven of them also were top ten in official world golf rankings points entering the president's cup. So again, we're kind of seeing more often than not, it's the better golfers because you want to put out your better golfers uh, to play more. And we've actually seen the international side, which has historically less depth filter more of their volume to the top, their best golfers. Um, Not going to read like it's, it's, it's pretty marginal, but you know, we see that the U S much more willing to rely on their depth. Yeah. So if you're looking at this market, just keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, especially with the veterans, we only have four veterans for the international side. So that's kind of bringing me back to Sung J M. Uh, Sung J M is very good. He's a very good golfer. He is top five this year in true strokes gained average, according to Data Golf. Uh, he has played in a President's Cup. He went three one and one uh, in 2019 for three and a half points to tie for the points lead back in 2019. He you know, again, I think people can get caught up in match play results and past performance at President's Cups or Ryder Cups. And I don't know if that's very predictive, yeah. but he did beat Gary Woodland four and three uh, in singles, and that's pretty dominant. So 
Sung Jm has what it takes uh, to play, you know, see as much volume as he can be kind of treated as the number one guy. So I think him uh, to lead the international side in points that was uh, plus 600. It's now plus 500, but also to lead outright in points is plus 1800. I think that's a pretty good value bet. Um, Billy Horschel, uh, I think stands out as like a, a potential wild card uh, point score, which is how it's listed on FanDuel Sportsbook plus 1400 captains picks can still see plenty of volume in this setup. So that's important. Uh, it's not just the qualifiers and then the captains picks are all, uh, you know, afterthoughts. Um, and again, with the international side's tendency to focus more on the top of their lineup, we've seen 11 of 16 wild card point leaders come from the U S team, which has more depth. It's willing to use more of that depth. Horschel, the kind of guy who probably is going to get, you know, four matches, if not, if not five, just a note on that. We will not get Thursday uh, lineups and, and matches until Wednesday afternoon. So be be aware, uh, be, be ready to, to, to pounce on that, depending on who, you know, for sure is getting a match. But he's also played Quail Hollow kind of well, if you care about the past decade. Um, T7, T29, and a missed cut. But I think he stands out at plus 1,400. And then just one final one, top overall score, Scotty Scheffler, plus 700. Those are like, those, those resemble sort of heavy favorite odds in like a full field. Yeah. Um, he should get plenty of volume. He's the top golfer in the world by OWGR, by, you know, total strokes gained average. He should be like a long-term anchor for the U.S. side, both in Ryder Cups and President's Cups. Great match play player. We've seen that from him. He's got Ryder Cup experience already. Good course fit. Does it all. Um, and 72% of points leaders came from the host side. So a lot goes uh, in his favor if you're looking for something maybe a little bit shorter uh, than 14, uh, you know, 14 to 1 or 18 to 1. With Sung Jay, you mentioned value potentially on both sides. Given the international um, tendency to go with a more concentrated approach, do you think that the 18 to 1 is the preferred market for Sung Jay for total points scored? I mean, I think I think it's totally fine to, to go that route. Yeah. Um, the biggest issue is he might play a lot, but even though he's a great golfer, they might not score enough points. Right. Um, you know, in his in his foursomes and four balls, but it's it's kind of up to up to you from a risk standpoint. I think sure. he makes sense for both. I think sure. you could probably bet both and kind of hedge a little bit in that regard. But again, it's you know, I you want to have fun with something like this and uh you know, but the reality is the US is is such a realistic heavy favorite yeah and we know that a lot of the point scorers you know from the overall standpoint come from the host side the winning side so just you know keep that in mind but uh sung jay i think is in, in the best spot for the the international team hey man rooting for sung jay there are worse scenarios than that you talking about having fun that sounds fun to me i know it's rooting against the u.s but like it's sung jm so i can i can make a leeway there that's fine yeah i mean it, it there's there's a lot to like on the international side. Mm -hmm. um, they've just been kind of picked apart a little bit, which is unfortunate. But uh, Sung Jay and uh, may, maybe a little bit of Corey Connors if you really want to get get wild if you're looking for Tita Green game. But I didn't Canada, want to recommend I didn't want to recommend him fully. That was kind of a <laughs> just a you and me thing. We'll probably get there. Love Corey Connors. All right. That is Brandon Gadula. Check him out on Twitter at Gadula13, senior managing editor of Number Fire. You can also find his PGA DFS uh, takes on the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast. Love them sprinkled in throughout the fall. Uh, talk some golf as well. Brandon, enjoy the President's Cup. Good luck to you. And I'll talk to you again Thursday for some NFL DFS. Yeah, best of luck uh, tonight with all your, your strikeout props. And I have best none. of luck this week. I have none. As we discussed with Rob, I've got nothing. I have one money line that I'm sweating. We'll see how that goes. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all good. I'm instead sweating NFL week three. So we'll uh, talk about that right now. Take our first look there again. Check out Brandon on Twitter at Gadula13. Let's dive in now to our week three NFL first look and go through what my numbers are saying about the opening lines here for week number three. And there is some value, I think, Specifically looking at some spreads here, there are a couple money lines I like, and then one total I'm betting. Don't have a model for that, but I will talk about that later on. The first one, and probably the one I like the most from a spread perspective, is the Steelers plus five and a half. Uh, it was five at FanDuel this morning. It's lengthened to five and a half, so I'm probably on the wrong side of this one, but I'm showing value there and a bit of value in the money line too at plus 184. 
but I want to go with the spread here. I've got the Browns favored by 1.97 points in this game, even with TJ Watt being out. And the reason I'm taking the points here is because I expect this to be a very low scoring game. The total does say that as well. Total for this game is 38 and a half, justifiably so. I'm expecting a low scoring game. It's tougher to win by five and a half points when, it, when there are fewer points scored overall. The Steelers did look pretty bad Sunday, but I respect the Patriots defense quite a bit. I think that that is explainable. Um, the Browns struggled a bit too. Obviously let up a couple touchdowns with their, there within the past 80 or so seconds. I think the one thing that concerns me most with betting plus five and a half here is that the Browns running game should be really good here. Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt, both those guys tremendous. And the Steelers do struggle there for sure. Having Watt out definitely does not help that at all. But it's five and a half. It's a low scoring game. I think it's a Jacoby Brissett team that's here by five and a half. I think I'd rather go with the Steelers side of this. I have faith in Mike Tomlin. So I do like the Steelers plus five and a half and we'll lock that one in right now. My numbers like the Cardinals plus four. I've got this as the Rams by 0.98. Now I was joking on Twitter on Sunday when the Cardinals were down by 20, whatever it was points that I was going to put in a, a vibes meter within my model to prevent myself from ever betting the Cardinals ever again. Then they came back. I'm kind of back in. And now I'm not sure if I can fully recommend this one to you uh, because the Cardinals have looked awful. But it's reassuring to me that the Rams have had the issues of their own, too. They almost had Atlanta win that game. Atlanta was driving. They were in scoring position uh, late in that game after coming back. I think I love Marcus Mariota, full respect to him, but Kyler's probably better than the Atlanta offense right now. This game is in Arizona. They might get Rondale Moore back this week. So we'll see. I am betting this one, but not necessarily recommending you do the same. Kind of a do as I say, not as I do type situation. I'm going to take it. I understand if you don't want to, I think my numbers are probably still too high on the Cardinals, but I think, I think if there's enough there where I will bet it. So for me, plus four on the Cardinals is totally fine. I don't blame you if you don't want to go there yourself. The Denver money line is showing value for me right now. Uh, that's at minus one Oh two at FanDuel Sportsbook. I have Denver favored in this game by 1.78 points. That is with a bump up to the 49ers, a Jimmy Garoppolo quarterback. Um, I like Trey Lance a lot and I was excited for him to play, but there was a lot of uncertainty baked into my numbers because we hadn't seen Trey Lance at quarterback. We, there was also no George Kittle. So when you give me more certainty with Garoppolo, I kind of don't have a lot of choice, but to bump up the passing efficiency on this team, we, they will likely get Kittle back this week. They got Ayuk, they got Debo Samuel. That's a lot of good pieces. So I do have the 49ers bumped up with Garoppolo in there. But I just can't get to can't get to this one uh, being uh, with the 49ers favor. Denver did struggle last week. They had a hideous success, right? But they didn't have KJ Hamler in that game. Jerry Judy came out mid game. Sounds like Judy should be good to go here. Sounds like they were saying he was day to day. And if he can't go, at least they've got the full week to plan around his absence versus losing him mid game. It doesn't feel good to bet Denver after how they played this past week, but I think this number moved too much after the Lance news with how Denver played in week two. I think it's an overreaction line to what we saw in week two with the Lance injury and with the Broncos struggling. I think there is value in the Broncos money line. So I'll take them minus one Oh two. And I feel pretty good about that one personally. My numbers do like the dolphins plus five and a half and the Titans plus two and a half. I'm not betting either. Although the movement has been toward the dolphins in this game. Uh, it moved like from three, four to six overnight with the doll with the bills playing pretty well, move back to five and a half uh, between opening reopening this morning. And when we're talking right now, my number, my numbers do like the dolphins, but like, I don't, we talked about this with Ryan on, on yesterday's show with the, with the, the bills. Like I, I just can't envision. I can see so many paths to this, this game going totally busto and feel like a moron for betting against Josh Allen. I think my numbers are a bit too low on the bills and just, you know, separating out a, the idea of betting against Josh Allen. Also not a ton of value here uh, with it being back at five and a half now. So I'll set this one out most likely, unless we see something drastic happen during the week. I'm okay. Missing out on the dolphins at plus five and a half. The Titans, Instead of betting plus two and a half, I want the total in that game. It's 46 and a half, and I want the under there. I did get the under 47 when it was up on Sunday morning. Went down to 45 and a half. Then went back up to 46 and a half this morning, and I don't know why. I'm not sure what the Titans showed you in that game to inspire confidence we should bet them. Maybe it's just uh, faith in the Raiders, but the Raiders' offense hasn't been that great either. Neither offense has blown me away to open this year. And it's a tough matchup for Tennessee. Um, 
the key strength they have on offense is running the football in theory. They haven't looked like that so far, but the Raiders defense, pretty good rush defense. So the Raiders, um, I think they're a good rush defense. They should bottle up this Titans offense, which is why I don't want to get to plus two and a half. But also, I don't have a lot of faith in this Raiders offense. They kind of run through Devontae Adams right now. We saw the Cardinals just devote every resource to stopping Devontae on Sunday, and their defense was pretty successful in doing so towards the end of that game. Hunter Renfro banged up. I'm not sure what his status will be here. I don't have a totals model, and I want to be clear in that because this is based off of other stuff. So it's not based off of, oh, my numbers say X. I do have numbers that project out uh, full game efficiency across both teams. And if I compare this game's projected offensive efficiency with the rest of the games on Sunday slate, the total for the other ones around it is around 41 and a half. So maybe you want the over on, you know, Packers bucks at 41 and a half, but I think 46 and a half is too high. Um, so again, it's not based on the model. This is based on gut, based on matchup, based on, projected efficiency and there are a lot more things that go into a total than those things but i will still take under 46 and a half on the titans and the raiders for sunday one other money line that my numbers like is the jaguars against the chargers now my my stuff tends to be very high in the chargers so this really did surprise me to see this happening but i've got this as a 5.2 five point game in the chargers favor so the jags win odds by my numbers around 33 percent their implied win odds at plus 265 are at 27.4%. So there is about six, five and a half percentage points of value in that this money line on the Jags. I'm unsure because I like what I've seen from the Jags. I think they've been interesting. They've been kind of pass heavy so far this year. They're getting first downs early in the early in the downs. Uh, Team Ariska of Pro Football Focus tweets out those numbers every Monday morning. They've been getting first downs early, which is, is a key thing to do in the defense. Played well against a banged up uh, Colts team on Sunday. I don't put a lot of stock into that defensive performance, but the offenses look good. So tentatively, I'm holding off. I don't like betting against Justin Herbert because he can do a lot of crazy stuff when the team takes the chains off of him. Uh, I'm tentatively holding off. That could change by the end of the week, but the Jags money line plus 265 showing value for me enough. So where I have to like at least consider it, not quite there yet, but we're we're looking into it. So the official ones I want to lock in right now. I want the Titans Raiders under 46 and a half. I want the Denver money line at minus 102. And I want the Steelers a plus five and a half in that game. Personally, I'm betting the Cardinals plus four, but again, I'm not gonna subject you to that once again. We'll talk more about the full slate coming up on Thursday with Ryan Williams. Again, Ryan doing well so far this year. We'll talk to him on Thursday to break down that slate, and we'll have uh the prop preview coming up Friday. But those are the primary ones for me. As of right now, let's finish things up here for today by taking a look back at last week and recapping college football week three and NFL week number two on the college side of things. Ed Fang got awesome movement on his bet. Uh, he had Notre Dame minus 10 and a half. That would close at 13 and a half. So no, no key numbers there, but still three points and three points. Pretty big move in his favor. But Cal, to their credit, hung around the whole night. They had a chance to, to tie that thing up at the end. Notre Dame did hold on for the outright win, but seven point win. So no cover there, but good movement for Ed long-term. You expect good movement to translate to good results. Didn't happen there, uh, but we'll see what Ed says for tomorrow in previewing college football week. Number four on the NFL side things. Our guests had a great week. Uh, Ryan Williams and Tom Vecchia, when he combined nine and one on their bets from uh, last week's shows on Thursday and Friday, Ryan hit the bucks and saints under 44 and a half. He had the commanders and lions over 48 and a half. For spreads, Ryan had the Jags plus four and a half. And of course, they won outright. Uh, he had the Packers minus nine and a half. They won that game by 17. He had the Patriots minus two and a half. They won by three. He had the Chargers plus four and a half. They lost or they lost by three. So pretty sick week by Ryan uh, across the board for that one. As far as last night's games go uh, on the Ryan side of things, we talked about a couple things. He liked the Eagles Vikings under 50 and a half. And I thought that was toast in the first half, but then second half really no scoring at all. Uh, had Devonte Smith anytime touchdown at plus two forty and a Dalvin touchdown at minus one fifteen. Didn't get those, but he was all over Stefan Diggs, And that pretty much covered everything for him in that game. He had Diggs over 75 and a half receiving yards that hit by like halftime. And he like doubled that up. Anytime touchdown, he had three, a plus one fifteen. So, a couple, uh, a couple ones didn't hit there for Ryan, but overall, great Monday for him too, uh, as well. So, a great week overall for Ryan last week. Check out Ryan on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. 
Good week by Tom Vecchio as well. Find him on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. Tom's lone miss on Friday was Ramondre Stevenson anytime touchdown. That was plus 230. He didn't score, but he hit Aaron Jones over 29 and a half receiving yards. He had uh, Darren Waller and Mark Andrews anytime touchdowns. Both those guys are plus 135. So good week for Tom. Good week for Ryan across the board. Uh, check out Ryan Alexander underscore W on Twitter and DFS underscore Tom on Twitter. We'll talk to Ryan once again Thursday to get his thoughts on NFL week number three. Not the best week for me by any means. Uh, we talked on Monday, but I had the Vikings money line. It was plus 118. When we talked, I believe it closed there as well. They didn't play well. Uh, every time the, the Eagles snapped the ball, it seemed like they were going to pick up 10 yards. I know the second half was a bit different, but like they were kind of in coast mode at that point. That that offense is real good. And I expected good things from the Eagles. I had the over on the win total at eight and a half at, when I bet it, but didn't expect that on Monday night. Uh, they played really well. So this this Eagles team is very good. I still think the Vikings will be good too. I still think that long term, they'll be a solid football team, but the Eagles are good. So lost that money line there. Other money lines I had from earlier in the week uh, were the Panthers and the Commanders. Good, good movement on both those. Uh, they both closed at even money. Uh, the Washington was plus 115. We talked Panthers were plus 118. They both closed at even money. So good movement in my favor on both those, but neither team could pull out a win. The Panthers had a couple of shots to do. So the commanders tried to claw their way back in that game. It did make it close, but, uh, no wins in either of those. I also lost Seattle on the spread plus eight and a half. They played bad. I think they might be a bad football team. I might've underestimated, um, how bad they actually are, but either way, lost that one plus eight and a half. Uh, the Cardinals did rally to cover and win outright. I had them plus five and a half. I personally bet the money line as well. Uh, that helped study at five and a half all week. I don't feel good about that win. Like it was a win. One of the few I had this week, but Hey, uh, you know, I don't feel good about it by any means. Uh, it was a win, but we'll take it. The other one I had, uh, was over 44 and a half of the Ravens versus the dolphins. That one was great. Um, no movement on that one, similar to the Cardinals one, but that one I did feel good about. Uh, my numbers for the projected total offense efficiency really did like the over in that game. It did turn that way with it devolving into a shootout. So feel good about that. Uh, don't feel good about the Cardinals win. Uh, Austin Eckler did hit the under 97 and a half rushing plus receiving yards. Talk about that on Thursday's show. He almost got there with some late dump offs, finished with 10 total targets and 14 carries. He made me sweat, but still got the win there. Just didn't think his role was that good. It did wind up being better than I thought it would be, but still hit the under there. So overall, three and four uh, across the week between Thursday, Monday night, and then Sunday was not my best week. We'll see if we can bounce back here in week three, but I think I feel pretty good about the week three bets we discussed. Of course, if I didn't feel good about them, I wouldn't bet them, but we'll see if we can bounce back. I'll try to emulate what we got out of Ryan and Tom this past week. As I mentioned, our college football week number four preview is coming up tomorrow with Ed Fang. We'll break down his favorite bets for this week. We'll also get you Ryan on Thursday, and we'll talk with JJ Zach Reese on Friday to get a prop breakdown. Should be a fun week once again. Want to give a big, big thing Thank you to our guests across the entirety of today. We had Rob Friedman, Pitching Ninja on. Talk about his favorite strikeout props. Find him on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. Find Brandon Gadula at Gadula13 and check out all of his uh, golf betting work over at numberfire.com. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to talk about some college football. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 